Well, hello, and welcome to another edition of the e-commerce evolution podcast. I'm your host, Brett Curry, CEO of OMG Commerce, and I am absolutely thrilled uh, about today's episode and today's guest. Uh, I go way, way, way back with this guest. We used to do podcasts together, you know, five years ago, six years ago, feels like an eternity now. Uh, my guest is Andrew Foxwell, and he is the co-founder of Foxwell Digital, which is a leading Facebook social agency and more. Uh, also, Foxwell Founders, which is really the reason we reconnected. I, I started hearing all this buzz about the Foxwell Founders community, and everybody's raving about it. I was like, oh, dude, I got to reach out to Andrew and see what's going on. And uh, he's doing even more than that. So we'll, we'll dive in. We're going to talk about what's working right now in terms of Facebook and Instagram. We're going to talk AI a little bit. We're going to talk about what is uh, Andrew's connections with Wall Street, which I think will be super fun. And so really looking forward to it. Andrew, thanks for taking the time, man. And, and welcome to the show. How are you doing? Yeah, man. Thank you so much. I'm doing well. Glad to be here. When, what, do you, when do you think was the last time we were on a podcast together? I think it was five years ago, six years ago? Easily six years ago. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Crazy. It's been, it's, it's been a hot min. But you know what? We're here now and we're better. We're, we're back and better than ever, baby. We're here now. We've still got lots of energy. <laughs> we got more wisdom. I got more gray hair. Like we're just, we're, we're oh, doing absolutely. it. Dude. We're out there doing absolutely. it. Absolutely. <laughs> So we're going to uh, both share our perspectives on kind of what's working with now and what's what's not. We're going to talk about AI a little bit, which is fun. And what's cool, Andrew, you know, you, you've you got this perspective. You run an agency. Um, you know, I run an agency, OMG Commerce. But you've got a, a bigger perspective even than that. I mean, your, your, your agency is amazing, but you've got this community uh, of 400 people in this community. So, so if you would, Andrew, kind of talk about what is the community? Because I think this will set the context for your perspective and some of the things you share on the podcast, but what is the community? Why'd you start it? And uh, yeah, give us the lowdown. Yeah, definitely. I mean, you know, a couple of years ago, our daughter was born uh, three years ago and, you know, it was really coming in, in, in pandemic times, feeling lonely and feeling like, am I the only one seeing this? And I felt like Twitter wasn't the best place for my mental health. Not always a positive place to hang. That is for sure. <laughs> yeah. And so, and I'm not saying it's all, all negative, but it wasn't the greatest place for me and I was feeling really down. And so, um, I decided, you know, Gracie and I talked about it and, um, I decided, you know, we let's, let's figure out a way to get our VIP course customers who bought, you know, more than three courses in one place talking and let's see if we launch a community. Um, and that was just the idea was it, can we, can we build something that's, that helps people feel less alone and more supported? Um, and yeah, now it's uh, 445 members from 25 countries spending over 250 million a month just on meta. It's brand owners, agencies, um, in-house people at brands. Um, we have, I think, five or six agencies. That our whole staff is in the membership. That's how valuable it is. Um, and we talk about, you know, everything under the sun, meta ads, creative, creative testing, CRO, Google ads, TikTok, all that. So, um, and running an agency, uh, big or small, we have places for both. So my perspective is, you know, not just my own, but is like, here's what we see across the landscape. And primarily, these people are in, um, you know, the United States, Canada, and in Europe. Um, so we do have members in, you know, South America as well, and um, Eastern Europe, and you know, Thailand, and places like that. But it's primarily focused in the UK, or excuse me, in the EU and the United States um, and Canada. So that's and and that's really you know a good barometer of kind of where performance is some, a lot of times on things. Um, and obviously still have the New Zealand and Australia members because they always get new features first. So it's always good to have too. <laughs> They're living in the future as we like That's to say. Right. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. So a lot of it, the things that I talk about, it's not just me, right? And it's, here's what I'm, here's what we're seeing across this breadth of people. And these are, these are primarily direct response D to C people, right? We need, we need to spend money to make money. And th that's what we're hired to do. Love that. Well, so this will be fantastic. I you obviously want your perspective too, but I know you'll be able to pull some examples and and you've got this influence of this uh, amazing community behind you. And so as we kind of dive into, you know, what's working now uh, primarily on Meta, but we can kind of talk a little bit about Google and and YouTube as well. But what are you what are you seeing? And we'll try not to get too nerdy or too technical here, but let's just talk creatives for a minute. What are you seeing that's working now from a creative standpoint? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, from a creative standpoint, there's there's a couple of different things. One is, 
building creatives that look sort of, um, you know, TikTok centric or uh, answering a question or have a, a good hook at the beginning from a video ad standpoint is helpful. So, you know, the more that you're answering questions and instead of thinking about, here's what I want to tell you about this service, you know, somebody the other day that was their member brought to me an ad and it was for a conference and um, it was talking about the conference and all the things that were going to be happening at this conference and he's selling tickets to this conference. Okay. And I was like, well, what are like, what are you ultimately trying to solve with people coming to this conference? What are the issues that they have? Right. And it's for people like business owners. So it was, you know, are you not, are you missing quarterly sales goals? Like you're identifying the problems and you're having ads that address those particular problems with, you know, the hook at the beginning and an explainer of what it does and making that ad more informative. So that's the kind of thing that we look at and you're looking at it generally in a, a four to five aspect ratio. So it's like more of a tall video format. Um, and you can also have static images that mirror that kind of idea too. So from a creative standpoint, that's part of it. And having at least somewhere in your mix creators or, um, you know, influencers or people on your own staff creating these ads with you and understanding how quickly the cuts need to be cut up in the video. So, you know, two seconds, two seconds, that kind of thing. And keeping an ad moving, um, is as long as those kind of elements are integrated, that's some of the best performing creative that you see across the board right now. I love that so much. And, and I would echo that. And I remember a quote from Google years ago as they were talking about, you know, the, the, their very first product, Google AdWords. And they said, hey, what if a good ad was just an answer to a question? Right. Yeah. And, I, and I think I think that's still true. And it doesn't just have to be true. For search, it makes sense with search because people are typing in a query and they're asking a direct question and you're giving an answer. But I think it's true in other platforms as well, right? Like we've all got these questions and these thoughts and these concerns that are banging around in our head. And so maybe the greatest ad or the best ads are just answers to those questions and, and hitting those uh, point blank. And so a couple of things we're seeing, you know, and we, we run, we do not run traffic on Meta or TikTok or any of those places. We do a lot on YouTube, one of the top spenders on YouTube. We're finding now YouTube Shorts. Uh, those are working fantastically well for remarketing, working in other areas as well. And we've been able to successfully pull content from TikTok ads and from Instagram Reels and use those almost unchanged on YouTube Shorts. And that's a bit of a new, that's a bit of a first for us because if we look at like what YouTube ads typically work uh, for standard pre-roll, you know, TrueView YouTube ads, it's usually ads that are minute and a half to three and a half minutes. It's more of a direct response field is what we run anyway. Almost feels more like an infomercial, but it doesn't have to look uh, like an infomercial exactly. Um, and so you, you've you never really been able to take videos directly from Meta and run them on YouTube. But now I think you kind of can with YouTube shorts, um, depending on, on a few things. And and I think, you know, one of, the, one of the things that we'll continue to focus on here is just like, how can we continue to write better headlines and better descriptions, mm -hmm. even in search. Because I think a lot of times you forget about search or if you mm -hmm. about your headline in Google Shopping or some of these things, but making little tweaks there, looking to constantly improve there uh, makes a big, big difference. So uh, creatives, I mean, as, as machine learning and AI improves, I think more of our job is going to be related to, to creatives, but we'll, we'll see. Yeah, I agree with you. You know, the question, the creatives is a really interesting piece. There's actually an incredible YouTube series by one of the agencies, um, to, to a couple of members of our community, um, Jess uh, Bachman from Fireteam uh, runs a show called Ad Topsy on YouTube. And you can just, you know, check it out. Barry Hotz, a, a, a regular contributor um, as well. And they go through and dissect ads. And we have some of this in the membership. And it's really amazing how much it can be broken down and how little tweaks can make a major difference. Another thing that's interesting about it is how much, uh, Jess is the one that told me this, which is I always think about is, what can you say that others uniquely, like that others cannot, that you can uniquely say? And that is a real, that's an interesting question to start to, to go after as part of the ad, right? Um, because a lot of people can talk about reviews. You can talk about it's the best window cleaner out there, whatever it is. But, you know, what is the uniqueness of it? And how is it being pitched? Um, because, you know, if it's eco-friendly, if it's 100% compostable, whatever, right? Even if other people share those, but they're not using that 
as something that you feel like you can uniquely say because it represents your brand, then that's a big deal. So yeah, it's, it's, it, you know, the creative thing is such a nuanced game, but once you start thinking in that framework, your whole thinking changes. And I've had to really learn this over the last two years because, you know, one of the big shifts, obviously, that we've gone through from the meta ad standpoint is we are no longer just pulling levers on Facebook ads. You used to be able to launch something with a white t-shirt and a white background and launch it to a PDP and it would convert. And like, I mean, not all the time and not great, but it, would, it wouldn't do bad. Now we're in this place where we've had to become marketers. Really, we're, you know, have to think of the whole funnel and it's made us better. I think ultimately is where it leaves us. And, um, and the creatives is part of that too. The ads are better and we're better at describing and pitching people on why they even should care in two or three seconds. Yeah, uh, it's so interesting. So I want to I want to, I want to key on a couple of those points. Uh, the, the first one, looking at you know what makes your ad unique or your product unique. Uh, I just did a talk uh, at Ezra Firestone's Blue Ribbon Mastermind uh, on seven ad tests to to evaluate your ads on before you run them. And one of them, the first one, was actually called the the scratch out write in test, where if you could take your ad and remove your brand, remove your logo, put in a competitor. If the ad still works, it's not a good ad, right? The ad needs to be unique to you and only. It doesn't mean that like every element has to be unique to you, but like the story as a whole, what you're saying with the ad needs to only fit for you. So what's unique? What's different? Is someone going to look at this and say, hmm, I don't know that I've seen anything quite like that before. And uh, that's not always easy to do, but I think it's I think it's really, really important. And so mm-hmm. that's something to keep in mind. And you know, what's also interesting to me, and we'll, we'll talk about AI more in just a minute, but... I think as as things progress and there's more machine learning and AI and yes, you know AI can dive into creating images and and headlines and descriptions and write you whole novels and stuff like that. I still think that there's this great need for strategy and someone who can understand marketing and understand product market fit and what does a customer want and if this thing worked, why did it work and what should we test next? And so there there's going to need this to be this this strategic component from really smart marketers. Uh, that partner, you know, with the machine, uh, so to speak. And so, yeah, it, it, any any thoughts on that before we, I want to hear kind of your thoughts on overall strategy and what's working right now. Yeah, I mean, I think that you're right in, in reference to strategy, strategic part of it and where that comes into mind is, you know, we have a, a lot of co- um, meetings of agency owners and it's a big, big group in our community. And one of the things is, um, is trying to help them get more leads. And I really am a big believer right now that if you're an agency or even if you're somebody that's in house, we were, you know, the DNA of how we were brought up, it was on this foundation of pulling levers. And like I said, yes. And now, if you can be someone where you're pitching your services and you're talking about being an outsourced CMO, for example, or thinking more strategically and being a true growth partner, that is a very different pitch and ultimately will benefit you in the long run more than this other guy over here that's Jimmy who can run f- Facebook ads, right? Like, and I think that we know this, but that's really what we actually need and what the client needs to be successful. And why I think a lot of us, sometimes you feel stuck. And I certainly backed myself into this corner where I feel stuck because I'm only thinking in one dimension and I'm not thinking about, well, wait a minute, like what's even the bundle that we're trying to sell? Um, and, you know, I mean, of course, what are the economics behind all of this? Um, and really, what is the understanding of it? So I think it's, that strategy and how you think about it, not only and work with clients on it, is helpful and useful, but it's also how you're pitching it to yeah. the client to win your exactly. agency and yourself more business because it's underutilized, in my opinion. And um, there's there's very few people that I can turn to to know that I'm going to get a true strategic read on it all. Yeah, and and I think in a lot of ways things have gotten as this thing have gotten more uh, advanced. It's more complex. It's maybe more difficult to approach some of these platforms than it was before, even though there's more automation and 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 yeah, to the 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 subject of pulling levers. You know that 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 was hard for some of our specialists internally. Like, hey, I've always pulled that lever. That that's that, that, that's what I do. I'm I'm really right. good at pulling that lever. But now you got to kind of raise up a level and think. Mm-hmm. I'm moving bigger pieces now. I'm moving platforms or or entire channel type. So now I'm looking at performance max, which is all Google channels rolled into one. And I'm still manipulating things, but at a bigger level. And I, I like the the analogy of an offensive coordinator. So to use like mm-hmm. a football analogy, you know, the offensive coordinator, mm-hmm. not on the field, not carrying the ball, not breaking tackles and, you know, throwing out stiff arms. They're elevated. They see the whole field. They're calling plays. They're calling in players, things like that. 
And that that's more, and I think that also ties into like this outsourced CMO type role. Like that's, I think, where, you know, agency of the, of the future, you know, really valuable marketing team members. It's it's more in that, in that role. So mm-hmm. you're still driving things, but just like moving bigger pieces instead of pulling small mm-hmm. levers. Yeah, I completely agree. Sweet. Uh, love it. So um, let's talk a little bit about what do you kind of see as recurring themes for, okay, if you're really going to make improvements, right? My meta ads aren't where they should be, or this platform's not working the way it should. Where What are the things we should focus on? Like what, what are some of the recurring themes of, ah, this is what we need to focus on to, to get better results? Yeah. I mean, I think from a Speaking through the lens of meta ads and people that are spending forward on meta ads, you know, you look, I was reading the, the North Bean newsletter where they put out, you know, weekly. Love North Bean newsletter. Shout out the guys there. Yeah. Spending is and how many people, you know, it's like, well, like 70% of people, it's still the primary channel and meta is for, for traffic, for chop funnel traffic. So, um, so I think if you look through that lens, what I, what you end up seeing is number one. A breakdown of um, those that want to improve, you have to, number one, have an idea of what the economics are behind your brand. And that's something that a lot still don't. And um, that's a hard thing to do because it's really outside of our zone of genius. I mean, I got a C in accounting. No, I can say that publicly. But like, it's not, I'm not a math guy, right? So that took me a while to figure that out. And Thanks to members sharing worksheets and things in the membership, I'm able to say, okay, you know, here's what we understand about that. Um, and you know, I think I was doing that a little, but I was not doing it a ton and was leaving it to people internally to do at the company. And now we have to become that partner. So that's number one. I think if you look just at Meta itself and like the things that strategically need to take place, it's making sure that you're customizing and setting up shops is another one. Because Meta Shops is going to continue to be um, a place that people are spending money and that Meta is spending your money forcibly or <laughs> or not. And it, like you're going to be continue to be pushed there for on-site checkout with shops and things like or on shop and, and checkout. Influencer has been pretty solid, right? I mean, and most of the the chatter I hear about it's been it all depends. all green. Yeah, it depends on it depends on who you ask, but yeah. it's but it's the point is is that you have to have. We used to have, you know, you would just set up, you know, I don't know, Feedonomics or something, right? And it would like build your catalog and then you were good to go. Pixel My Site Pro or whatever, right? And now you you can't just have that. You have to have a, you know, having a customized catalog as part of the shop is a really important part of it. So customizing that commerce experience is helpful. And I think it's something that can improve. I think from an account, you know, obviously creative, we already talked about that. Having a, an inbound of creative that is consistent and um, constant based on how much you're spending on different angles and hooks and having a plan of how you're going to test them is a must because a lot of people have that, but they have no plan of how they're going to test it. And so you end up with all this information that doesn't mean anything. So, and that same goes for landing pages and having um, landing pages that in the best case scenario match the creative that you're talking about so that the, you know, click experience is more clean and people understand what you're trying to sell them. Um, so I think that's, that's another one. And then I think from a technical standpoint, you know, having and testing advantage plus shopping campaigns, if you have not, is something that's going to continue to be a priority, especially in 2023 Meta's given access to it now to basically every account. So, and what it does is, you know, you put in assets and there's no targeting, really. You just set an existing customer cap. Um, And so it seems to be a good vehicle for top funnel traffic and for literally all funnel traffic, but it's utilizing a different algorithm, it seems thus far, and we're still learning about it to get top funnel traffic in. So, um, or get, you know, quality traffic into your site. So I think those are sort of some of the like, uh, foundational pieces that we need to be aware of in terms of what's working and changing, um, you know, the plan that you have. Yeah, I love that. I want, want to highlight a couple things. One, looking at you know metrics and what are we measuring and what are we focusing on. And and I think there needs to be like this hierarchy, this hierarchy of metrics. 
right? Yeah. Where at the top uh, is our financial goals. What are our business financial goals, whether that's contribution yeah. margin, EBITDA, whatever the, like that top level goal is. And likely the the in-platform goals that we usually focus on, you know, ROAS or CPA or CAC, they're important, but they're only as important as they help guide those financial metrics, right? So yeah. understanding that, understanding why do we want a 200% ROAS or a 400% ROAS, why? What is that? What is that contributing to, or what is that uh, rolling up to for those those uh, the hierarchy of of metrics? And, and a quick example: we had a client come to us recently uh, for Google Ads management, and they said, "You know, we really want to be at a four hundred percent return on ad spend." And as we uh, started asking questions and digging a little deeper and trying to understand why, it became clear that the four hundred percent was just kind of like what other people said. And 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 so as we started actually running ads and experimenting a little bit, they found that. A 200% return on ad spend actually contributed to their their metrics better. More new customers, their new customers were sticking. It fed to overall profitability, and so now they're growing at a much a much faster rate and hitting those profitability targets. So I love that. Like really understanding the numbers. It's not just I'm following some random benchmark, but I'm mm-hmm. understanding my business numbers and then I'm optimizing uh, to hit that. So any any tips on how you like how you coach people or help people? I know you said. Uh, accounting I mean, wasn't your thing. I didn't like accounting class either, although I, I do like numbers. Um, any, any tips or suggestions there? I mean, a lot of it is the, you know, get some sort of worksheet or framework that you're able to look at with the business owner and walk them through it and how it, how it can then tie to um, the ad goals that you're looking at in terms of transactions or conversions or return on ad spend from either the in-platform metrics or a in-platform metrics plus it's like a scene of comedy it's like yes and right so yeah yeah that and a third party tool and ga4 right like make sure that not only you have a plan and understanding and walking through it with a client but then you have an understanding of what are the daily metrics you're looking at and how are you um how what making sure you're looking at the same thing so that's like the big one that i don't think a ton of people do right out of the gates and you have to make sure that you're you've agreed on that as much as possible yeah, I think that this, this tri- triangulation of data is really important. So in platform, yes, got to look at it, that third party, whether it's Triple Whale or North Beam or, or what have you. And then, of course, GA4 needs to be there as well. And yeah, I think I think trying to simplify a little bit where you're looking at, you know, what's our MER, our media efficiency ratio, our, our, to- mm-hmm. our total money in, total money out? Uh, how are weekly sales changing as spend changes on various platforms? Like looking at really simple stuff that you mm-hmm. can use to make um, some general uh, directions or observations, and then and then digging into the details inside of you know Triple Oil and North Beam or, or GA4. Uh, I think I think that makes a lot of sense for sure. So um, very cool. So uh, yeah, and then and then looking at you know really understanding uh, what what kind of testing we're doing, or or rather how to approach testing. I love that you added that because even if we're getting really creative and really thoughtful with our ads. If we don't have a methodology to test them, then either we're not going to give them enough runway or we're going to give them too much space and waste money. Any any tips there, again, without getting too detailed or too into the nitty gritty, any tips on, you know, testing methodologies or where someone should start? I mean, you know, testing is like, number one, establish what you're trying to learn. So yeah. actually, like, what do you want to know? Number one. Um, and if you want to know, well, I want to know what creatives work and I want to know what landing pages work with them. Okay. Um, totally can do that, but let's not do them at the same time. Um, and let's make sure that we understand first that probably creative itself in terms of understanding, if you've taken over an account and you, and the person has not really done creative testing, the, the number one right out of the gates is try four or five different angles in static ads and figure out what on a broad audience they're responding to based on the, you know, what we call soft metrics, like the ad level metrics. So that's number one is just like, figuring out what are they responding to, and then from there going into testing different variations upon that particular things that they're responding to, and then from there going into landing page testing, which can be a big unlock. So it's more about like, what yeah, like what are you trying to figure out? And also then being patient and knowing that to figure, you know, a lot of these pieces out, it's going to take time and money to do so. You're not going to be losing money, but it's not going to be a major moneymaker right away if this has never been done. A lot of times, too, people testing to a lot of agencies, and I think as an insulation for their own agency, is a 
they make it really complicated to make themselves look really smart. Yeah. And, <laughs> and, and in the reality, the best testing that I can do for you is putting things in a broad ad set. So 25 to 65 men and women or, you know, split by gender or whatever, and just launching it <laughs> and like seeing what creative metrics are going to work. It's not necessarily anything, you know, we used to have a thing where you would graduate then you would, or then you would say like, okay, that ad did really well. Now I'm going to pull it into my other ad set and run it. Not something you do anymore. You know, we, we, what we call scale in place. If it's working, keep it rocking, right? You don't need to move it Love that. just to have it be there. So a lot of times it's, and you know, well, what am I going to do? Launch another broad ad set? Yeah. Launch another one, like, and eliminate the one that did well. Keep that baby rolling, you know? Um, and so I think as humans, we want to complicate things. And in reality, put the complication and your brain power into the different variations on creative and the different hooks and the way that you're talking about them and the different angles you're going for and how they can speak to different segments or problems that your customer has. Um, and that's going to be more beneficial than trying to complicate it at the other side when it comes to testing. Love it. And and yes, I, I can attest agencies are guilty of that. And I can pick on agencies. You can pick on agencies. You're an agency owner, so am I. It sounds cool when we invent our new way of this is a proprietary way of testing and this is our model and it's a 75 point test. And it's like, okay, yeah, you probably don't need all that, but but that does sound impressive. So yeah, yes, yeah, simplifying um, is great. And I love the idea of scaling in place. We do the same thing on YouTube. Like if you find, if you're testing a new ad and it blows up in a campaign, don't move it. Like let it live there. That's it's got all the oxygen and all the data. Uh, just, just let it, let it roll. So, uh, I love that. Hey, let's, let's pivot a little bit. You and I can geek out on ads and strategy and what's working, what's not, uh, forever. But I want to talk about AI just a little bit. So sure. what, what are you hearing in the community? What are you testing? Are you, extremely bullish on AI? Are you, are you a little nervous about AI? How, how is it impacting things right now from your perspective? I mean, I think it's two, two prong. One is I think there's, um, the, the first one is there's operational AI. So, you know, what are you doing in terms of operations for your agency or for your brand in terms of coming out with more iterations of things, um, copy, uh, you know, uh, hooks and angles language, you know, I mean, that's one part of it. And then there's sort of like meta AI. And what is Meta doing with it? And what are they trying to go for? I think on the first one, there's, I'm, I mean, I think across the board, I'm bullish on what it can do for us. I think the, but, you know, with, as we all say, with a healthy dose of skepticism, I think for sure on, on the first one, operational stuff, like there's, well, where do I, how do I even begin to say this? The, 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 the issue I see in the landscape many times, and a lot of us, you know, you're in the space just like I am. I talked about the complication of ad testing. There is very little that differentiates a lot of creative agents or a lot of agencies now in terms of the skills. A lot of us have the same skills. And so people are looking for anything they can do to message about that they're doing that's different. And AI is currently, it, I mean, remember the days of like ManyChat. It was, we're the ManyChat agency or, you know, it's this little thing that doesn't actually do. And a lot of people have put their eggs in the creative basket um, and uh, are saying, well, we're a creative shop, but we do ad buying, which I'm not saying is bad, but a lot of people are saying that. And AI is currently being used in this. And so they're saying, okay, well, I have a 50 point AI framework for your agency. So I think number one, as you think about this stuff, you have to be really careful of what is that actually doing? And is it creating more volume of, you know, copy or videos um and are they actually productive or is it actually helping so that's really like where my mind goes on the first part of it on the operational side i think that there's a lot that can happen um to summarize and to look at data and help you interpret data and things that you would not have seen so that's an interesting one i mean watching sessions from Clarity or whatever, Hotjar or whatever, right? Where it's giving you a readout from what happened with those people. I mean, that kind of stuff's really helpful. I think from the mind journey type creative of video that's AI and that kind of thing, images that are AI, 
I think it's okay. It's in its infancy. Some of it looks a little corny and I don't think feels genuine to it now. But, you know, people are pushing the envelope on it, which I think is good. So that's like one thing. On the meta AI side, you know, what's going on there? It's clear to me that Meta is investing in this and will continue to take more controls away from us as advertisers. The they're gonna, you know, you're gonna put in assets and Meta's gonna decide where to put them, and it's gonna be an advantage plus shopping campaign, and it's gonna be, you know, kind of like a performance max style. The issue with that I have with this is Meta has a bad track record with allowing freedom in terms of ad placement and display. So we have a client that's running a sale right now, right? And we turned on in Advantage while Shopping Campaign, you know, the automatic optimization. Well, it put the text in all the wrong places and it cu- cut off one of the texts and it made the ad look terrible. And the client's getting screenshots and sending it to us and saying, this looks terrible. So that's, a, that's like, I think, an AI issue <laughs> right out of the gates. But, um, you know, there's other things like, they're, they came out and said they're going to they're testing this lattice framework where it's looking at essentially you know federated learnings which are learnings across a whole bunch of accounts and they're calling it lattice and saying okay you know here's what we know and we're matching this color background to this person because we know they respond to things in purple okay so like the early tests of that stuff haven't been doing anything they've been performing way worse than anything that we've created and um so I'm not saying it's trash. I'm just saying right now it's not proving to be anything big, but but it will be more. I mean, there's going to be endless options, and I think you're going to have to be, one, pitching your clients to be more comfortable with the changes that are taking place and like with the fact that they're dynamically changing your ads often. And number two is you're going to have to be more patient because the AI is going to take some time, I think, to learn and like figure that side of it out. And I think ultimately it will be m- there could be instances where it's more profitable, but it's going to, and the initial side of it when it's learning going to be really tough because you're going to be getting screenshots of your clients when the ads that look really like that don't look good. So it depends on how much customization they're doing in this too. So, you know, that's like my honest answer about AI. I mean, it's, I I think it's, there's a lot of people that are really excited about it. I think that's great. And I'm not, I'm not, not excited about it. I just, (laughs) <laughs> and I'm a meta doesn't have a great track record when it comes to this stuff. And, you know, ultimately th- I think about what creates more work for us as agencies and they're saying it saves us time. But if the client's blowing us up with ads, that look like crap. That's not going to be good for anybody. That does not save you time for sure. I like the way you frame that. I'm not, not excited about it. <laughs> and that's why I feel about some, some of the AI related topics. I'll, I'll just kind of key in on a couple points related to operational AI I think it's really in a place right now where it's all about augmenting, not replacing, right? It's about helping you do more with less, faster, give you ideas, helping you not start with a blank canvas, that type of thing. I've got some friends who are developers and coders, and they're saying, hey, with the proper use of ChatGPT or whatever their favorite tool is, it makes them 20% faster with coding or maybe 50% faster for certain things. It, It helps them. If you look at a really good copywriter, maybe you're using AI to kind of get you some thought starters or to tweak things or rewrite some things, but... As I've looked at stuff that AI just creates on its own, I'm not finding subject lines that are better than what great copywriters write. I'm not seeing uh, descriptions that are better than what great copywriters write. I know it's improving. I know it will continue to improve, but I really think it's like augmenting, not replacing, at least so far. We'll see how it how it progresses. What's really interesting, and I'll be very uh, curious to watch you know, how meta AI unfolds and, and want to keep up with, with you on that. With Google, like Performance Max, one of the concerns I had when I first heard this talked about a couple years ago was, man, we're not going to have any control. Like this is going to all be black box. We're just going to serve Google our assets and step away and like hope for the best. Um, Actually, you can do that. Like there's some ways to run Performance Max that are very much automated, but there's also quite a bit you can manipulate and quite a bit you can move around based on the way you structure your campaigns and then also looking at performance data, changing your creatives, changing a a few of the signals and things like that. And so I I think that's probably the future too, where there's, there's going to be this option where you just like, here you go, here are the keys, Google, here's my money, here are my assets. Um, And same with Meta. But I think there's also going to be this way of, 
okay, I'm going to leverage some of the automation, but I'm still going to apply my strategies and I'm going to, I'm going to apply my testing framework as best as I can to this tool. And I think that's where you're going to get the best results. So, so far we've had great success with Performance Max almost across the board, but companies that are spending like 50,000 a day on Performance Max, usually it's not just one campaign that they built in an afternoon and, and don't think about it. So it's more of a complex structure. So We'll see, man. I, I'm I'm bullish, but I think I may I think I may have to copy your. I'm not not excited. So <laughs> I love. Yeah, that. I mean, I think you know, there's t- to me the practical implications of a performance max. Right, you look at. I did a webinar with Northbeam a month ago with John Moran, and John's talking about. Love that dude. Super smart. Was talking about something along the lines of running a performance max campaign, but then running something that then suppresses a certain part of this performance max campaign, so that it actually spends in the places you want. And I don't remember exactly like what it, what it was, but the, the 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 point is, I could see that happening with meta ads. There's going to be you know like yes, you're running advanced ball shopping campaign and AI is part of it, but you're also then taking and creating a separate catalog or something, a product catalog with things that you want to suppress, or you know it's that kind of manipulation that I think is going to have to take place and probably will. Um, it, it just remains to be seen what that'll be and how much money will be spent figuring that out. Right. I think, right. you know, we're sort of in this place of a lot of people during the pandemic had businesses that were running online. And now we're coming through this piece of, man, you know, operationally, things aren't looking as good or ads aren't performing as well. And um, there's less levers to pull, you know? And I, I think it's, when you think about AI and giving people, a, like you said, a longer time frame, you know, if it's a fifty thousand dollar a day thing, they're going to be fine. But it's these little guys. I think about they're spending twenty five thousand a month. They're going to be the ones that are hurt because they're not going to be able to test this, and they right. might not be resourced right. enough to know where to direct to where to direct the dollars more appropriately. So that's going to be really that's going to be really challenging, and and that's a hard place to be as a business owner, especially when all of your traffic has come from Meta, totally. From, you know, from one source. Yeah, we know so many small businesses that. They really built their brand, built their business on Facebook and and maybe partially like in the glory days of Facebook. And Facebook is still going strong and still working. But but yeah, yeah, it will be those with smaller budgets that don't have the ability to to adapt that will be yeah. hurt the most, which really is a great reason why someone needs to get connected to a community of other smart people and learn and re- be ready to adapt and improve. And so... Tell us a little bit more about the founders community. Who's a good fit for that? How do people find out more? Yeah. Uh, give us the lowdown there. Yeah. Um, if you do, you know, digital advertising, you're an agency owner, you're in house at a brand, you're a brand owner, um, and you spend anything on Meta or on, uh, you know, TikTok or on Google, um, it's going to be a place for you. We have the founders community, which is the original. It's been around for two years. That's for people that are primarily spending on Meta. And a month ago, we launched the PPC community. Um, the PPC, the, bo- bo- the main founders membership is foxwelldigital.com forward slash membership. The other one is foxwelldigital.com forward slash all caps PPC. And um, they're, they're places that are su- supportive to you. It's, a, it's, you know, we have between five and 10 calls a week that members can join, um, led by different members of the community on a myriad of topics. Everything's recorded, put into a database for you, lives as a Slack community. You can ask anything you want. It's a safe place. It's moderated by me. Um, I have an outsourced moderation. It's me, um, which is a big part of it because it's a I want to make sure it's a big job. stays high um, and the quality stays high. Um, yeah. I mean, we just asked, we just did a monthly member survey. A couple hundred members filled it out. Um, 99.9% of people said, yes, I'd recommend it to a friend. Um, so that's who's a fit, it, you know, if you're looking, if you're, yeah, and big and small spenders. I mean, we have people that are spending, on, that are brands that are spending half a million a month just on one channel. And we have people in there that are running, you know, their whole book of business is 100K spenders, right, you right. know. Um, and I've tried to build a community for both of those people. Um, so, and, and also running an agency and how lonely that can be. So if you feel like you need a little bit more support, and then that's a good place for you. Yeah, it, it's so important because you know it is kind of lonely whether you're running an agency or you're serving as a as a marketing director or media buyer because you know like we're going to talk to your family about changes right. on on Meta or Google <laughs> or 
talk to your family about, hey, man, my, my margins are just really down this year. It's really, it's really uh, getting me down. Like it, it's hard to have those conversations with just anybody. You need a community like this uh, where you can connect. So love that. I'll link to everything in the show notes. Um, and then also Foxwell Digital. So you you run an agency. Uh, talk about what services you guys offer and who who is that a good fit for? Yeah, I mean, we run a, an agency. We do um, meta ads for people um, and, you know, take on a couple clients a year. It's not a huge book for us. Um, and that, and we do a lot of strategic advising to agencies. Um, we do a lot of strategic advising to brands. So if they're looking for a new advertiser, sometime we'll come in and, you know, do an audit and say, here's what we'd recommend and help them find a new partner. Um, we've successfully placed, uh, well, let's see, what year is it? Uh, 2023. 2023. Yeah. So it's May. So I just looked at the numbers and I think it was something like 21 leads we've placed in agencies this year. Wow. Um, that's and, what so that's a big part of what we do is playing matchmaker. Um, and as far as I know, they're all still there. Um, and I, that was part of the work, the due diligence that we're doing is checking up on it. So that's a big part of it too, is kind of that matchmaking process. Um, yeah. And then we do this consulting with Wall Street as well, which is fascinating to talk to them about the public side of a lot of these companies and what they're doing. So you, you've got you've got banks, you've got people on Wall Street that are talking to mm-hmm. you mm-hmm. on a regular basis saying, okay, mm-hmm. give me the inside scoop. What's what's actually mm-hmm. happening inside of Meta and inside these communities because we need to we need to know. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, you know, the, the best part about being a direct response advertiser always has been is that we are always the one out there hustling, right? We are the ones that are testing everything. We're trying everything. I mean, Lord knows we'd all love to be a brand advertiser and just be doing <laughs> freaking hundred grand in video views, right? Like, how did you optimize your campaign? I turned it on. Yeah, yeah I, I did. I used to actually do some of that consulting work uh, for three or four years ago with a, a brand that, or a, I guess a publisher that did a lot of partnerships with those brands. And it was amazing. It was like, it was so awesome. You could just turn stuff on. They just had endless budgets. But, you know, I mean, the good news about being a DR advertiser is you have you have the look into here's what's working. Here's how it's going. Here's exactly why. Here's what sucks. And, you can, and, you know, it turns out Wall Street's willing to pay for that. So if any of you are interested, you can go to GLG or um, GuidePoint are the two networks and you get you fill out an application and then they reach out um, and you can uh, be connected basically to people on their staff. Um, but then they send you calls and you can talk to people <laughs> and they pay you for your time. Cool. Super cool, man. So, so interesting. Well, uh, love all that you're doing, Andrew. It's been an absolute pleasure to catch yeah, up. Yeah, man. Thank you so much. I'm looking forward to that PPC community, man. I'm looking forward to hanging out a little bit with my all peeps right. in there and talking Can't wait. PPC. And so, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll link to everything in the show notes. Do check out Foxwell Digital. He's got some courses as well if you want to learn through courses, if that's your jam. But, uh, Andrew, super fun, man. Thank you Thanks. so much. And, and we'll have to do it again. So, yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Awesome. And as always, thank you for tuning in. We would love to hear from you. What would you like to hear more of on the show? Do you have any suggestions, any guests that you're like, hey, this guest has got to be on the show. I would like to know about that. Um, and hit us up. Look look at me on the socials now, man. I'm more active on LinkedIn and on Twitter, sort of. And I uh, would love to connect with you in uh, the socials or on the socials as well. And with that, until next time, thank you for listening. <laughs>